So, I wanted to talk today uh, about uh, security headers in web applications. Web applications are what I do day in, day out today on my, my bread and butter. Um, what I've been doing uh, a lot of recently is using uh, headless CMSs with Jamstack uh, and then kind of things like Gatsby JS uh, content, which is which is the uh, uh, headless CMS from the Kensco guys that I, that I work a lot with. Um, one of the things I noticed is a lot of sites built using Jamstack, using static site builders, they tend to be kind of bereft of any security headers. So I kind of wanted to do a quick talk about what they are, how we can add them, and, and hopefully someone will walk away and add them to, to some sites. So let's go into it. So um, why do we need security headers? Well, the security headers basically let a user agent or a browser know what your application is going to be trying to do. They're, they're telling it what sort of external data sources and content sources to, to expect. Uh, we're telling the user agent how the application intends to, to expose itself to the world, uh, what kind of features of the devices perhaps it's going to be using so that the, the agent really knows what it is you're trying to do and any sort of evil naughty script that's got in there is kind of kicked out of town fairly quickly. Um, uh, the, there are several things um, that security headers cover that have been in the OWASP top 10 vulnerability uh, list for several years. And yet they're still there because people like me uh, don't necessarily like setting security headers because they can be a bit of a pain in the butt to get right. So um, it's definitely worth having a look at the OWASP website. If you're not familiar with it and you do web development, it kind of tells you a lot of things that are useful. Um, there's a link um, just over there if you want to go and check it out and, and you can get a little bit more information, they've got an entire project dedicated to just security headers. Um, so how do you go about testing them? There's, there's, there's two things for testing a security header. Um, you need to check they're there and you need to check they actually work. And those are two very simple, <laughs> different, different things to look at. In terms of checking they're there, there are a couple of sites you can use. Uh, one's called securityheaders.com which is a fairly straightforward thing. And there's also SERP works, which I've used a few times. There's, there's others out there. They all do fairly similar things. You provide your URI, you click test my headers, and it's going to go and scan and check the existence of particular security headers on your site. It's not going to check they work really. It's just going to kind of check they're there. Um, they will give you a link to go away and look at some additional information about what those headers are as well. In terms of testing it, my experience tells me that actually what you're looking at is debugging in the console, uh, uh, as this screenshot here shows. It's, it's kind of looking through Chrome and seeing what's working, what's not working. It would be nice to be able to get this just working on dev all the time, but there are certain differences between a production and a non-production application like Google Analytics or Tag Manager that behave differently on production URLs to um, development URLs. Um, the more complex your application is as well, the more testing you've got to do to go and check that your pages are working and do what they need to do. Um, when you talk about what headers to include, I don't have enough time to go through them all. There are many. So I've picked a few that I, I think are kind of the most interesting ones. The first is the feature policy, which is quite an experimental thing at the moment. And it's really covering what your application can do on the device that it's running on. So whether you're going to be able to use the payment request API or whether your app or anything embedded with it can use the camera so that you can make it a little bit more secure, for example. Um, you just add as many of this particular header you want uh, as you want, and it will just kind of append to the end of the value that's, that's carried through to the user agent. Um, strict transport policy is a really good one. Effectively forces your application to run within HTTPS and tells the user agent that as soon as it's been there, I'm, I am HTTPS, you, should, you must always use me for this domain, but also for this period of time. So if you can see here the max age, I think that's a year, probably is if my math is up to anything. Um, so for an entire year, if, you're, if you revisit that site, it's gonna force HTTPS, which is great if you go to like open Wi-Fi or something like that and someone's kind of trying to give you a bad certificate experience by being a hacker and being super elite, your browser's not even gonna try it because it's already gonna go through HTTPS. Um, that can also then improve page load times. X-frame option policy is a brilliant one. This is this this protects you from click jacking, uh, basically. So, click jacking is where someone kind of pops a layer over the top of your website and then just captures all your key events, click events, etc. So they can do some pretty pretty horrible stuff. It's a pretty simple one. You can deny it or you can allow it uh, with the same origin as as your current application. So it's really quite a straightforward one to put in. 
And then my personal favorite, which doesn't make you pull your own teeth out and, and bash your head on the desk is content security policy. This is, this is probably one of the biggest ones and it really helps against cross-site scripting. Um, it can be very complex depending on how precise you want to be. It can be very simple uh, if you want it to be, but you can only set it once. So you're either setting it when you start up your application or on each individual page. Um, and you can see from the kind of things you can specify where your, where your fonts, your images, your, your scripts, et cetera, are gonna be able to come from when your application is running. So in terms of how we set them, there are a couple of ways to do it. This, this is actually based on an article I wrote to do with Gatsby. Uh, so I've kind of crowbarred in uh, some .NET examples because that's probably a little bit more relevant to everyone here rather than how we do things with Netlify, Netlify and, and so forth. So uh, first one is you can just set these things in your HTML header. Um, it's a meta tag, you use HTTP equiv, which tells your user agent that that's equivalent to a HTTP header, uh, and then you put your content in the source. Um, if you do this, it's nice and individual for every single page that you're using. It can be a bit odd when you're testing it with developer tools. Sometimes it, it kind of doesn't show up that you've used that header, but it, it, it is there. Um, and that's, that's kind of the easiest way to set it. Um, if you want to do it in ASP.NET Core, this is a great example of how you can do it in your application uh, configuration. Uh, you just do an app use, and then you're adding in response headers into the HTTP context um, in there, and that will then apply to all of the pages and requests. There are also obviously some NuGet packages you can use um, that will give you a little bit more control over how this might work. And then there's also uh, web config. Yay, we all love web config. Um, so yeah, you can just go in here into the HTTP protocol and add custom headers inside there. You can also remove ones that you don't want uh, if you want to. Uh, and then that again will apply to all pages uh, within the application. Obviously, it's worth saying this also applies to API requests uh, as well as uh, web pages. So that being said, also, uh, that's not the right slide. That's the right slide. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to do is really just show a really very, very simple example. I did start doing a whole load of things with MVC uh, and then I thought actually that was a bit too much for what I needed to do. I just want to show you some HTML. So here's my amazing web page that I didn't at all make this morning. Uh, as you can see, it's got a lovely JavaScript pop-up, the kind of thing that we all like, and it's got an image and some text. That's all great. It's a really simple piece of markup and this is what it looks like. Um, there's my H1. I've got an inline style because I'm a naughty developer. Uh, I've got an image. I've got my nice little bit of script here, but I haven't got any security policy. So let's let's add a security policy and just see how that works. Okay. So if I go meta um, HTTP equiv, and I'm going to set this up as the content security, and you all get to see how bad I'm at typing. So I do apologise. Uh, we go. We go some content. There we go. Okay, cool. So one thing to know about the content security policy is there is an overriding value called default source. Uh, and this is what will apply to everything. So I'm going to do a fairly simple default source, which is just anything from my own uh, source will be allowed. If you go back over here, what you should notice is everything breaks and goes horrible and I get a bunch of errors in my console. So yay. We can fix all of these ones really easy because it is just a simple example. So in terms of this one here, the first option is telling me that I'm trying to use an inline style and that's not allowed because it's either unsafe in line or I want to use a SHA code to tell it which thing to use. So the SHA code is just a, an encrypted version of the code I'm trying to execute. Really easy to fix that. I'm just going to go um, style source. Still want self because I have things that I want to run from my own um, origin, so that's cool. And I don't know what key I just pressed, but that was not what I wanted. There we go, we'll reload that. And what we can see now is my style is coming in. I've got my, my purple text back. I've still got these two to deal with. And we just keep on adding and adding. So Chrome Chrome is actually doing a lot of work for me here. It's telling me exactly what's wrong and allowing me to just simply go in and say, right, well, that one was an image source, so let's Go in and fix that again. Anything from my end domain, I'm going to keep. Plus, I'm going to take anything from placeholder IT. I don't care about the specific image. I want that. There we go. We'll save it. And the only thing we're now missing is the super annoying uh, JavaScript pop up. And for that one, I'm just going to do what it suggests. I'm going to take the shard. So it's basically created this hash of my joyous JavaScript function for me in Chrome. 
you can do this yourself on the on the command prompt. It's not, not a problem. Um, so we're just going to add script source in here. Again, we're going to say well, it's self and then pop that in there. And it's annoying me. Yay. So there we go. That's a really, really simple little stop tour of adding one of the security headers. Obviously, there's, there's quite a few of them. And as you go through, they get more or less complex depending on what you're trying to do. Um, my, my great example is if you add Google Ads, it adds everything and you end up in a big chain of pit of despair. That is it. Um, that's all I kind of want to say. I've run over by 30 seconds, so apologies uh, to Kev, who's going to be next. Um, what I would say is I look into these security headers and make sure you know if you're doing web apps that you've got the right ones in place because it's going to help protect you, your company, and your, your consumers of your data. So definitely go for it.